Good morning. Let's stand, let's sing together. Welcome this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so excited to be together to glorify God this morning. At this time, I will ask you to be seated, and I do want to make an announcement. I just want to remind everyone that on Sunday, September 11th, our 9 o'clock Arbor service will be back inside. Sunday, September 11th, we will be back inside in here, but at this time... Let's continue to worship. Continue to lift your voices.
sing it again. Beautiful Lord, let's lift our voices. Sing this together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me. this time we have a very special back to school presentation and let's check out this video. Callie Garvin, fourth grade in Rock Springs. Emma Ingalls, fourth grade, Rock Springs. Jenny Garvin, fourth grade, Rock Springs. Elsie Keener going into fourth grade at Starwood Christian Academy. Dorothy Keener going into sixth grade at Starwood Christian Academy. Claire Handy, fifth grade, Rock Springs. Emerson Epley, second grade, Pursuit. Charlotte Rosford, first grade, Rock Springs Elementary School. Emily Edward, second grade, Lincoln China. Charter. Lila Witherspoon, third grade, Rock Springs. Blythe Epley, pursue kindergarten. Amelia Silden, first grade, Lincoln Charter. Maddie Silden, Lincoln Charter, first grade. 
Parents got into going to kindergarten. You let us call fourth to grade Rock Springs Elementary. Hi, I'm Hadley Nash. I'm going in first grade Pumpkin Center. Eva Nichols, first grade Balls Creek. Kyrie Bennett, first grade Pumpkin Center. Hannah Huggy, fourth grade Rock Springs. Hi, I'm Ethan Legrand, and I'm going into third grade in my school with St. James Elementary. Adam Palmer, Rock Springs, second grade. Hi, I'm Jackson Glenn, and I am in fourth grade, and I go to South Lake Christian. Hi, my name is Caitlin Seib, and I'm going to fifth grade at Pumpkin Center. Hi, I'm Owen Legrand, I'm going into fifth grade, and I go to St. James Elementary. Benny Abernathy, third grade, Jerry Washam. Trent Nobles, Falls Creek, third grade. My name is Brooke Rollins, second grade, Rock Springs. Layla Palmer, fifth grade, Rock Springs. Good luck heading back to school, guys. It's gonna be your best year yet, I know it. You guys are gonna rock it, and just know that we're in your corner praying for you every step of the way. All right, well, good morning. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. My name is Ben, I'm one of the pastors here, and back to school season, we are excited. Parents, how about you? Are you guys excited for back to school season? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, I, I am excited for these uh, kids. We want to recognize the back to school. The, this is the promotion Sunday where, you know, if those kids uh, who are on the threshold between, you know, children's ministry, youth ministry, they're more than welcome to move up now. And, um, and we wanted to take this time here to bless the backpacks of many of the, the children that you just saw during this video. Um, we hope that this blessing of the backpacks is, is a... Um, is a symbolic gesture of just like the song we sang about the Holy Spirit coming to mold us and form us and use us for his glory. Uh, we pray that through this, um, that these children are also ambassadors of the kingdom, shining light in a dark world. So join me as we uh, lift up uh, this prayer. Father, we thank you so, so much for the beautiful blessing of children. Thank you for their joyful hearts, their beautiful smiles, and their and their hungry attitude and, and hungry curiosity to learn more. I just pray as we go back to school, one, that you keep our children safe, that you watch over our schools, the administrators, the staff, the, the teachers there. You give them wisdom and discernment to protect our children and also for our kids to, to live out your ideals, that they would love others, forgive others, that you would keep our schools safe, that you would help them learn and grow and and basically be disciples for your kingdom out in this world. And let these few backpacks be uh, symbols of all the backpacks, Lord. Continue to work in our schools, continue to work in each one of our students, um, whether we have them here or not at Denver UMC, just continue to work your kingdom, your will through our schools. And also at this moment, I just wanted to lift up a special prayer. Um, Father, it breaks my heart to hear but uh, we just want to lift up uh, James, that he is the grandson of Greg and Lisa Clark. And we know that he is going through some complications right now. And I just want to lift him up right now. Um, Lord, that you would give everyone involved peace and assurance. And that we would see him start to progress by the end of the day. To show signs of getting better. To wean off of oxygen and all those things that, that he is being hooked up to. Uh, Lord, I just, it breaks my heart to, to hear when children are suffering, and I know that you have the power and the authority to do something about it. So I just pray in your name, Jesus, that you would help James get better in this moment, as well as continue to work through our kids, through these backpacks, and allow them to be ambassadors for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this moment, I, I also want to recognize in this time of offering, uh, whether you give here or give online, um, we just want to also recognize the, the ministry that you guys make possible. Uh, we, or personally, I had the opportunity to be part of a couple of ministries this week, but just know that in the background, we have so much going on behind the scenes. We are building ramps all the time. We are helping people with, uh, with uh, Furnish the Future. This past week, we had a, um, a lady who had her home burned down uh, from an, uh, a really tragic accident that we were able to step in and help furnish uh, for her new apartment 
some furnishings for her to live with because she lost absolutely everything. And so it's not possible if we don't have the resources to be able to do that. And thank you for providing those resources. I'm going to ask our ushers to come up at this time to grab some of our baskets, if you don't mind. Uh, some of the ushers that are in the room. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. And uh, yeah, and we are going to spend, take this moment uh, to give. So thank you again. Back to you. for this last chorus. Let's lift our voices together. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. We cry holy, 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 holy is the land. bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, just as we sang, we cry holy. God, we know that you are wonderful and mighty and that you love us even though we don't deserve it. God, help us remember that we are here to glorify you this morning. Help us let go of all the chaos of last week and everything coming this coming week. And help us remember that you are in control. God, we thank you for the service. We thank you for the word we are about to receive. And we pray that our hearts are open to receive it. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place this morning. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is David Washko. I have the pleasure and honor of being one of your pastors here. So I welcome you to those who are here, the guests that uh, arrived today, and those who are, are online. I do have one other announcement that uh, Pastor Ben reminded me of. Tonight at 6 o'clock, correct? 
uh, for the Harbor Youth is a parents' meeting. Uh, in this meeting, you will get to learn what's going to be going on this coming year with Harbor Youth. I heavily encourage you to attend. Um, ben has a super strong heart, not just for the youth, but for the parents to know the messaging that he is sharing with our youth. Uh, so um, that's tonight at 6 o'clock and officially starts next Sunday, correct? 9-11, okay. So, so parents, please take time um, and share what's on your heart with Ben too. He wants to know what's on your heart and the messaging that he could share with our children. If you would this morning, please come to prayer with me. Lord, thank you for this just magnificent day that you've put before us. It's magnificent, Father, because we get to be in relationship with you. We get to be a part of your beauty, your creation, Father. Lord, it doesn't matter what the weather is, whether it's sunny or raining. Your creation is breathtaking. And Father, I'm not sure why you've chosen us, all of us, to be in relationship with you, but you did. And not only did you choose to have a relationship with us, you are purposely, intentionally seeking us, pursuing us to have an intimate relationship with you. So Father, today we get to come together we made the choice, Father, to come here to be together, not just to hear your word, but to learn, Father, how we can grow closer to you, to use our gifts, our God-given gifts that you've blessed every single one of us with, to share with our brothers and our sisters. Father, you've given us the first of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit, and so I ask that the Holy Spirit speak through me today and may your word be interpreted as it was only meant to be interpreted. Eliminate, Father, any of my projected thoughts, my interpretations. May your word fall on the ears and hearts and minds as it was meant to be heard. We ask all of these things in your glorious name, Lord. Amen. A legend before she even sailed, her passengers were a mixture of the world's wealthiest, basking in the elegance of first-class accommodations, and immigrants packed into storage, steerage. She was touted as the safest ship ever built, so, that, so safe that she carried only 20 lifeboats, enough to provide accommodation for only half of her 2,200 passengers and crew. I know we're all familiar with the story of the Titanic, but I believe through my years of leadership training that most people are only familiar with the story of the Titanic. They don't know the story. See, yes, I am in agreement. There's no hidden agendas. It was sunk by hitting an iceberg. But that was not the ultimate demise that led to this tragic situation. See, man has a very interesting way of clearing his conscience. He likes to point to inanimate objects, take the path of least resistance, or to point elsewhere before considering looking inward. Similar to today's scripture reading, Outdated rules, ego, and greed are the key players in both of these historical events. Yes, there's all sorts of theories that are going on about the Titanic and how, why it sank. It, people say that, oh, they were trying to break the transatlantic speed records. That is certainly not true when you look at the facts of the size of the engine, the, the speed they were traveling. People talk about the inferior steel rivets that is true, but they were only used in per certain places of the, building the Titanic. So let's be clear, though, on what the ultimate demise of this sinking ship was. Because it was actually 
the 1,500 souls that drowned at sea that was the result of the demise. See, management team frequently in their board meetings used this sentence. It was designed to be practically unsinkable, a lifeboat in itself. Outdated rules. There were 20 lifeboats. Now, this was the proper lifeboat to people ratio for the times. It was the minimum standard. They focused on what was traditionally done, not on the welfare of human life. Now, Alexander Carlisle, who's the director of shipbuilding, knew that this wasn't proper. He, but he, yet he says he regrets he did not speak up or push back during the meetings and demand that there be enough lifeboats for everyone. The decision was made based upon the aesthetics. They decided not to add the additional lifeboats because it would take up valuable visual space. And this decision led and was part of the drowning of more than 1,500 lives. See, being in compliance is not necessarily sufficient, as we will learn from today's scripture. Ego did play a role. The speed of the ship did play a role. Management decided that they wanted to arrive in New York one day earlier so that they can make a bigger splash in the media headlines. Because of this, the ship was traveling at 22 knots on average, which gave Frederick Fleet, who was the seaman responsible for being in the lookout of danger, only 37 seconds to respond once he saw the iceberg. He saw it with the naked eye. Why? Because seaman David Blair, who was responsible for the keys to the lock of the 50 or more binoculars on the Titanic, was transferred the last minute and forgot to hand the keys over, which led to the seaman of no longer having the tool of binoculars to be on the lookout. Interestingly enough, in 2007, those keys sold for $145,000 in an auction. Greed undoubtedly played a role. See, White Star Lines, who was owners of the Titanic, at that time partnered with the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company. The Marconi Wireless Telegraph had just recently been invented and they wanted to be able to have a way which this provided to communicate transatlantically. The telegraph operators were not part of the crew of the Titanic. They were actually employed by Marconi. And the goal, the reasoning for having this telegraph on the ship was to send and receive commercial paid messages for the passengers. So the passengers were able to speak to people on land and receive messages. The Titanic received seven warnings, iceberg warnings. And one hour prior to hitting the iceberg, the SS Californian, which was on the same shipway as the Titanic, only one hour in advance, sent back a warning message that there are icebergs to slow down and be on the lookout. And the operator who was working the telegraph machine that worked for Marconi, not the Titanic, is recorded as saying, shut up, I am busy, I am working. In today's reading, the influences of outdated rules ego, and greed play a role in losing sight of what's truly important, saving souls and glorifying God. Today we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. It's titled, Christ Heals the Crippled Woman, but it goes so much deeper than that. It is written, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she went bent double and could not straighten up at all. 
When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the things that I find fascinating is when we, you read scripture, some big points hopefully stick out. But then when you read deeper and deeper and read it over and over, over a period of time, things show up that you didn't see the first couple times. And then I like to, before I do my sermons, um, as you know, I used to say before I got my pastor's license that I provide a view from the pew because I'm one of you. I'm not seminary trained. And so I like to sit down with a group and get their insights and thoughts of what they think when they read the passages and then that helps me be able to speak to a broader audience and so reading into this scripture there are so many important things that jump out about this so first of all it says and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the sabbath not just anybody could walk up in the synagogue and begin preaching you had to be invited. So this is a situation where Jesus was invited by the leader of the synagogue to preach. So he, this leader clearly understood Jesus' authority and thought they were in some type of alignment with their beliefs. And there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. 18 years now, as if it's not enough that she had this debilitating physical ability for 18 years, that was clearly no fault of her own because it says she was indwelt by a spirit. 18 years, I mean, think, we may be, some of us know somebody who's been afflicted for 18 years. How hard it is for them to get around. 18 years of probably praying to God, I don't know why I've got this physical disability, but I'm praying to you, God, to heal me. 18 years. What's impressive is I would like to believe I could do this for 18 years and still show up to church, that my faith is that strong after 18 years of living like this. And so here she is, 18 years, and she's still showing up in the synagogue because she has the faith level of Abraham. I believe every word in this Bible is specifically put here by the Holy Spirit. And so when I read, I like to look at each of the words and their meanings. And I find it fascinating when it says that Jesus saw her he called her over and said to her. Now, here's a lady who's literally bent over. Jesus sees her. She's not coming there to see Jesus. And he, instead of going over to her, has her come over to him. That doesn't sound like something I would have thought Jesus would have done. I thought he would, he's such a compassionate person. You would think he'd walk over there. But there, I believe there's meaning in all of these words. And I believe we're told by the writer and Jesus did this so that we would know that this healing was unsolicited. That she was there, not because she thought that, oh, Jesus is here, I can go touch his cloak and can be healed. I could be lowered through the thatch of a roof and be healed. No, 
She was there simply because of her level of faith. And Jesus, like he always does, took the initiative. And it says that she was freed from sickness. You know, ironically, it doesn't say like most other places in the Bible, Jesus cast out this evil spirit. It simply declares that she was loosed from this spirit. And what does she do? How does she respond? I would have responded, probably dropped to my knees and put my arms around Jesus' ankles and hug him and thank him. She goes straight to glorifying God. And notice, Jesus doesn't take exception. He knows that's why he's there on a Sunday, or excuse me, on a Saturday, the Sabbath, working and healing as this official seems to think. And it says, the synagogue official indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. When you read this, many of us, when we were reading through this, just saw this as, hey, this, this has nothing to do with anything, but he got upset because he grew up in a certain set of rules. That could be true. But clearly his ego got in the way because of how he responded reveals that. See, I think this is a good example of when we read this, are we reading it to learn it? As if, as if this, as this synagogue leader we knew was doing, memorizing it? Or are we reading this to have a relationship to be able to glorify God? See, his actions say his ego got in the way. He responds by yelling out to the crowd. He could have handled this in a different way. And I find it interesting that the writer, Luke, uses Jesus' name. But when it's time to elevate who Jesus is and his authority, he doesn't use the word Jesus. He now uses the word Lord. And the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? In other words, do you not take care of your valuables, those things that provide you income, that keep you wealthy? Do you not take care of them on the Sabbath? Are you putting value on your oxen over the welfare of this lady? That's the greed. He, Jesus also calls her daughter of Abraham. He calls her this to elevate the importance of what's going on here because as you probably may remember, Abraham and Sarah waited for 25 years to have their prayer answered, 25 years to be able to have a child. This lady, after 18 years, showed the same level, same kind of faith as Abraham. His opponents were humiliated. Well, this could have been easily avoided. See, I think this leader handled the situation the same way that so many of us do today, and especially the generations after me, because the generations after me have not seen conflict management modeled. They have not seen what good communication looks like and being modeled for the most part. And so this leader had three ways to respond. He could have internalized it, like many of us do, he could have spoken to the offender, Jesus, like we are called biblically to do. Or he could tell others, which is the route he chose. He chose to go the social media route, right? He just threw up on everybody instantly to show his authority, to show his knowledge, and to degrade what Jesus was doing by disrupting the normal flow of the synagogue service. 
He disrupted and overstepped one of the 613 Jewish man-made interpretations of the commandments. Imagine if he had simply just pulled Jesus to the side and said, hey, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. And Jesus probably would have replied and said, yeah, it's the Sabbath, and that means resting and keeping it holy with the ultimate outcome of glorifying God. And is that not what took place when I healed this woman? Did she instantly not go to glorifying God? And I think, as much as a disruptor Jesus is, I think he probably or could have said back to this leader, what if this was your wife? What would you have me done? Jesus is incredible at disruption, and he does it to wake us up. And so today... Harmlessly, I'd like to disrupt our service. And simply, all I'm asking for you is to please stand. Just stand right now. Because this is not what we normally do in the middle of a sermon. And what I'd like for us to do is to pray together. And if there are any of you who are feeling as if you're suffering because of a prayer that's gone on so long and not been answered. If there's any of you that are feeling despair and are just in search of Jesus' comforting hand, you feeling his presence, you can either raise your hand, you can sit down, you can stay where you are, but know that we are all going to join together now and pray as Jesus did in the middle of a sermon. Father, we come to you as a body, your body. You brought us here together, Father. And Lord, parts of our bodies are going through a tough period. I don't know if it's 18 years It may be 18 months, 18 weeks. I don't know, Father. But I know there's brothers and sisters here that are just in a place of pleading, a pleading and wondering how you're going to answer their prayer. Father, we know you answer all prayers. We also know as tough as it is, You answer them in your timing, not ours. But, Father, we know it's not because you don't love us. We know you're moving puzzle pieces around because it's more than just about us. It is ultimately about God being glorified. So, Father, if there are any distractions in our lives, if there are any practices in our lives, if there's any ego, outdated rules, any greed that are interrupting our flow of glorifying you, Father. Let us be brave, obedient, and willing and asking you to reveal them so that we can ultimately be in glorification of you, Father. May those who are hurting feel your presence. May they feel your comfort, your touch, Father. Lord, sometimes it would be cool just to see somebody healed and stand straight up. But Father, that would be for our selfishness. Only respond in ways that are in your glorification. We ask all of these things in your glorious name, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody told me on Monday night when we were sitting down, they said rigidity can be blinding. And I really believe that's true. Rigidity can be blinding. A few uh, months ago, I gave the sermon 
that was titled based upon what my previous pastor's sermon was because it altered my life. And I shared with you, it was called Outward Conformity Versus Imperfect Intimacy. This story today is about outward conformity. And Jesus clearly gave us an example of what imperfect intimacy looks like. So in tradition, as you know so well of me, the call to action is this. Self-examination. Be bold, be willing. And asking God to reveal to you what rules, what practices, what actions are you taking? Am I taking that are about the external, the temporal, and not about the eternal? And please understand this. I'm not saying that the Sabbath is not important because the Sabbath is. I don't want you to walk away thinking that we're busting chops on this leader. The Sabbath is important. It is important for keeping it holy. But the purpose is so we can remain in an intimate relationship with God. That's the importance of the Sabbath. So let us not do things that are at the expense of us not glorifying God. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this church, this congregation, your body. We thank you that this is a church that has a servant's heart, undoubtedly. This church rises to every single occasion of need, Father, without fail. Father, help us to remember that we're doing it in service of you. We're doing it so that those who are served can see what it looks like to glorify you. Help us not to ever lose sight through our actions, through our services. Father, help us to grow closer to you. Help us to be one step more transformed to being look, looking like your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I send you out this week, hoping that you'll be bold, brave, and willing to Ask God to give you his examination as to where you could be glorifying him more. Amen.